and then we'll make sure not to get you on camera. Super important. Um, also, our speaker, Lucian Greaves, will be debating the independent candidate for governor tomorrow uh, about abortion at 5 o'clock here. So you shall come. It'll be great. Uh, Sam, can I do Hi, I'm Samantha. I'm the vice president of MU Sasha, and uh, we are very excited about our next speaker. As an activist and co-founder of the Satanic Temple, his brazen brand of activism has been making strides for both religious equality and the separation of church and state. From a mock rally for Satanic children in front of the Capitol building in Florida State, to a statue of Baha in Oklahoma City, he and his temple know how to make a point. Now, mock Satanic ritual, mind control, and cultic world domination, a paid of guide. Please help me with some solution greetings. So, in 2010, I found myself 90 miles south of Las Vegas in a poor man's version of Reno called Laughlin. Uh, it's just at the border of Arizona, and that uh, river you see is what divides Laughlin and Arizona, and it's just between time zones too. So, uh, when I was at a conference and the time kept switching on my phone, it was, it was very confusing. Um, I was there to hang out with people who felt like they had been abducted by aliens. These are people who believe they had been abducted and taken away by extraterrestrials and that they had some kind of contact with them. Um, I learned that not everybody considers themselves having been abducted. Some of them had very positive experiences. And in fact, uh, the whole scene isn't as unified as you would think. Um, I went in there thinking that aliens were known to look like this, big heads, black eyes, uh, gray, and, uh, and, and prone to doing bizarre sexual experiments on humans, anal probes, and, and making hybrids between uh, aliens and people. But that's kind of old school at this point. It had fallen well out of fashion. and People seem to be competing with one another to tell more and more bizarre stories about uh, more and more different types of, of alien life forms. But um, despite the, the disunity, it was an agreement within the experiencer group that nobody would question anybody else's reality. And it's, it's very difficult to maintain your cognitive dissonance sometimes with some very bizarre, deeply held beliefs, but, but this was very helpful to them. And they felt that um, it was very nice to be in an environment where you could just be validated and you could, uh, and you could go and, and, and simply be believed, even though I got the impression that most people were listening to each other without really believing the credibility in anybody else, but really looking forward to telling their own story for whatever reason. But there was a prohibition against inquiry, and there was definitely a prohibition against questioning anybody else's, uh, anybody else's belief in, in, in their alien abduction experience. And in one bizarre moment, there was a woman who showed us an illustration, crude illustrations, many of them, and they all resembled uh, very well-known cinematic aliens. Uh, there was a crude rendering of E.T., and it was labeled E.T. And she told us, I call this one E.T. And I thought that that sounds very natural, of course. And there was a, even one of Yoda, who she referred to as Yoda. And for a moment, I thought, she must be fucking with us. That she, that she too was an interloper, and that she was probably talking to a hidden camera, and that she was making a big joke of, uh, of the abductees. But the more she spoke, the more I became convinced that that wasn't the case. Um, she did address the fact that these crude renderings by the names of their cinematic counterparts were recognizable as being film aliens, and she explained that as a, uh, and this is a prevalent notion, there was a lot of conspiracy theories at this, at this conference in general. People don't generally just have belief, but um, uh, her feeling was that Hollywood knew. Hollywood knew about these aliens, and this was this has been a a, a long, decades-long program to warm us up to the idea. Uh, they have their kind of own 
uh, Revelation's idea, the day will come and all will be revealed and the truth will come out and Hollywood, the rest of the media is all working towards that at some point. People are trying to slip out there. Um, now, these people in this in their environment, it's easy for them to kind of hold these deeply held beliefs and none of them really were entirely lying. Some people would lie, I think, to make up evidence, but um, part of the reason people had these deeply held beliefs was they had been going to regressive, they've been going through hypnotic regression and other memory recovery techniques to learn what we had concealed from their consciousness. And oftentimes those, those uh, narratives involve uh, abducted by aliens. But they only seem to, to involve that when the hypnotherapist believes that people are abducted by aliens and this, that this is a prevalent problem. So obviously there's an interplay between the therapist and, and the people going through the therapy. And within the hypnoregression therapeutic scene, obviously, there isn't agreement as to how this is properly done or what's the, the proper narrative, because some of these narratives are mutually exclusive. And we uh, spoke to some of the hypnotherapists, and, and you can see this kind of juxtaposition in their opinions on this clip. There are a lot of people who think that this is an outlook of they these things are kind, wonderful, and loving. They have two things in common. <clears throat> One person with great notions of that agenda and the so and memories, or they have no hypnosis whatsoever. And they're mistaking certain procedures for one section, which they don't even take. <clears throat> which they don't understand. I'm not going to say that now I want or benevolence. I'm saying that they're working for their own agenda that, that, include, that doesn't include us. Let's put it that way. It might include us in a peripheral way, but they're doing this. This is a program we're looking at that is, <clears throat> we used to think that this was a study. This was, a, uh, they were learning about us. You know, that they were grabbing people, like trying to help them and, and, and see what makes them tick. Yes, after some labor and it didn't go. We couldn't, the evidence just wasn't there. This is a program, and the program has a program that has a beginning, a middle, and an end, and a goal directed. In other words, you're doing this for a reason. I'll ask the questions around here. <laughs> <laughs> and we're uh, doing this for a reason. And so, what is the reason? Well, <clears throat> And there's a lot of people who have posited they have a dying planet, they have, they're looking for resources, blah, 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 blah. Uh, but um, the reasons for the ultimate reason, I'm saying, we don't really know. We don't really know the ultimate reason. My personal opinion is that it's an integration program to the society by hybrids. That could be wrong, uh, um, but uh, we don't know why. We don't Well, a lot of people think something terrible is happened to them when they've had a UFO experience. They think they've been traumatized. They think they have hurt in some way. Um, uh, that's not what happened at all. It could be a very simple experience. But their conscious mind has made it into something that's beautiful. That's the difference. Can you tell me about an example? There's so many of them. I'm just trying to think that. Well, there was one. How this is. Of course, it's a pretty. She kept saying she had experiences with the ET, and that they take her own board of craft, and they, they do all these terrible things to her. They cut her brain, but that does not happen. And the things that she was doing, they don't do it all. And they explain this. We know women are sensitive about their breasts, and they said during their examination they have to do, we accidentally pushed against her. And that was all that happened. 
but she interpreted that and she will help the food in part. The difference? They're performing the narrative under their, their not a progression. And if you would speak to Dave Jacobs and Dolores, they're they're very adamant that there's no leading at all in, in any of this. But of course, this this is very much in, in the field of what people consider insane and very much um, <laughs> not taken seriously, the, the, the narrative of, uh, of, of alien abduction. But it's, uh, but what's scary about it is uh, these people who undergo this, uh, this regressive therapy inform these false memories of abusive uh, contact um, these memories uh, react in, in, a, in a very in a very real traumatic way. There was a study done at Harvard uh, led by Richard McNally, who's a professor over there, which tested psychophysiological responding uh, related to script-driven imagery um, related to alien contact with people who felt that they were abusively abducted by aliens. And what was found is that they they, they had very traumatic responses. They they, they believed this. These were these were embedded memories, and these were these were traumatic memories for them, even though it was true. And uh, a grad student of Richard McNally's went went on later to write a book about the alien abduction scene. Oops, sorry. And she she traced the origins of the belief and the, and how the. Uh, false memories evolve in a culture where people have this kind of unified belief of alien abduction, which, which I said isn't really unified after all. And um, what was interesting about that is, is Susan Clancy was, was pilloried as somebody who, because she was doing this research, was protecting pedophilia. And you, you might wonder how you would get from, from there, from alien abduction to being accused of protecting pedophilia. But if you uh, understand where these notions of traumatic repression come from and these techniques of drawing forth the memories, uh, you realize there's nothing different in the psychotherapeutic community when they do this to try to uh, bring forward supposedly repressed memories of incest or whatever else. So if you call bullshit on this, it calls into question the entire industry and people claim that Susan Clancy is, is protecting pedophilia. I went uh, about a year before that conference to a conference of people who felt that they had been ritually abused or subjects of government mind control, and they also had hidden memories of this. And I noted in the report I had written about the conference that one of the first things I noticed was that at, the, uh, at one of the vending booths, they were selling a more advanced species of tinfoil hat, as I, <laughs> as I characterized it. But that, that's from the catalog of the vendor that was selling it, a classic baseball cap lined with a fabric that uses silver and copper threads uh, to create an, an electromagnetic 3C shield. And uh, there's also socks you can get with this and, and other, and other uh, convenient outerwear and those types of things. And there was, a, there was a woman there, she was all of 40 years old, went by the name of Royal, and she was claiming that she personally was a mind slave of Nazi Dr. Joseph Mengele and uh, to Satanism and she said uh, my experience with Mengele involved much of the trauma-based mind control involving core programming such as end time programming that is connected to the global takeover he used the psychic spiritual dimensions using what I have come to call which involved using musical tones and to open up portals into the spiritual realms I also have core programs set up that were created using abortions as a means to develop them and more. Um, what was really scary about this was there were licensed medical mental health professionals there <coughs> getting continuing education units for seeing this kind of bullshit. And this was considered a, a professional conference in that regard. Um, and there was also a prohibition within this support group against critical inquiry of any kind. There was uh, this idea that uh, confronting anybody's narrative, no matter how implausible it, it could be, is triggering. Um, and, and this was my first introduction to the concept of safe spaces. So this is kind of a, kind of gives you an idea why I have reservations about that now. And people can say, well, satanic <coughs> ritual abuse and alien abduction 
those are entirely different premises. And if you start out with a, with a different premise and, and have a safe space environment where you have this insular positive feedback loop, it's something different. But really, the alien abduction people and the, uh, well, especially the satanic abuse people, tell you that they're only coming from a premise that certain tra traumas are, are so, uh, so oppressive that mind represses them. And at the core of it, they just believe that child sexual abuse is wrong. And if you question that, if you, if you question any element of what they're saying, you're questioning that. So you can start somewhere with the best intentions, but if you shut off all critical inquiry or, or free speech in any type of way, um, I think this, this kind of product is not an outlier. This is a natural byproduct of shutting yourself off from, from critical inquiry and debate. Now this woman, Gigi Jordan, in uh, 2010, murdered her eight-year-old autistic child, and she did so because she thought he wasn't actually autistic at all. She thought that he was being tormented by some unseen satanic conspiracy, and that the only way to preserve him from further sufferings was to uh, put him down, sit on his chest until he was uh, quite bruised, according to the prosecution, and force feed him an overdose of uh, Xanax and Ambien with vodka. Um, what was really disturbing about this case to me, besides obviously she killed the kid, was that there was uh, there were many opportunities I felt for people in the healthcare field, mental health professionals, to disabuse her of her illusions of satanic ritual abuse. But what I found is that she consulted a woman who's tied in with the network that gave uh, that has given lectures at the conference I was at before. A, a, uh, a clinical psychologist. So the oversight on this is, is horrific and, and definitely uh, something, something that needs to be confronted. We, we put together a petition against the, uh, against the therapist in question and we're protesting her professional organization next month. And uh, I really hope we can bring some kind of remedy to that. But I also think we, uh, we need to think differently about about this kind of idea of, of, of there being a, a, a safe insular structure in which nobody is questioned on their bizarre beliefs because it can, uh, can spiral out of control and we see what can ultimately come of it. Particularly disturbing to me is that we find uh, recent pupils to show that 40% of millennials and 35% of Democrats are for censorship if it's deemed offensive to minority groups. That, that seems like a, a very that, that seems like a very dangerous path to go down, for, especially for me, being in the Satanic Temple, because we're often mischaracterized and sometimes the offense taken is completely wrong. And it hasn't always been right. Um, you might be familiar with Edward O. Wilson. Uh, at Harvard University, also when he started the, his studies in sociobiology, he was talking about biological basis of, uh, of social behavior, which I take pretty much for granted now. But at the time, people thought that uh, this kind of refutation of the blank slate was uh, was opening the door to racist notions of eugenics and that type of thing. In, in no less than Noam Chomsky had to come forward and, and say what should have been obvious to everybody that humans are biologically based and should be studied as such. And, and eventually, I don't think people think even of Edward Wilson uh, at all now uh, relating to this controversy. No, nobody thinks of him as, as a racist or anything else, but at the time, people were throwing things at him when he was giving public lectures. And then now, and also the uh, study of child sexual abuse, it is still such a taboo topic that if anything challenges the dominant narrative, it's so easy to dismiss somebody as, as defending pedophilia or ruin their reputations in a similar way that people are afraid to do it. And another case of that that would be worth looking up is the, uh, is the Rind paper controversy. Um, some scientists led by a guy with the last name put together a meta-analysis of, uh, of surveys done on people who suffered from some kind of child sexual abuse 
And uh, overall, his findings, the only real controversial element that was involved in that was that he found that uh, people who had been molested weren't necessarily uh, resigned to a life of, of crippling mental damage, that type of thing. Um, he certainly wasn't saying pedophilia was right, and none of the scientists were. They were just looking at the data. And, and it's, it's, you have to look at the facts if you want to help people who actually survive, but this was altogether too much, and it was the first scientific paper that was censured by an act of Congress after Laura Schlesinger uh, took it up and, and made a, a big cause out of it, and eventually uh, Tom DeLay made it his own personal cause as well, and and I think the paper ended up rejected. I'm not, I'm not sure, but but not on scientific grounds in the least. Now the uh, the need to be able to engage in offensive speech, I, I would argue for, because obviously we do that. Uh, you may be aware that uh, that we did what we call the pink mass at the grave of the mother of Fred Phelps Jr. while he was still alive um, in protest of Westboro Baptist Church. This was in response to the Boston Marathon bombings when the Westboro Baptist Church said that they were going to <coughs> protest the funerals of the people who had died during the bombing. Um, they didn't show up. Uh, a lot of people in Boston were, were waiting for them there. And things could have gotten easily quite ugly. Um, but at the time, there was a petition going around Boston to actually get the government to intervene and prevent the Westboro Baptist Church from showing up, which I, I didn't think was appropriate. What I thought was appropriate was that we found a way to protest them on our own. So we went and conducted a homoerotic ceremony at the mother of Fred Phelps Jr. And we, I, I respectfully rested my testicles on her grave and declared her a lesbian in the afterlife. But we were also clear that we didn't hold any supernatural beliefs, but that we felt that due to their supernatural beliefs, they were obligated to believe that she was a lesbian in the afterlife. And that no matter what they said, our belief was inviolable. And we were going to believe that they believed that she was lucky in the afterlife, despite anything <laughs> They had made the inviolability of belief argument uh, all the way to the Supreme Court to uphold their right to protest. When Fred Phelps Jr. was dying, my good friend's advice he asked me to <laughs> write a eulogy. And in part, I said, it is often considered proper form for the remaining party of two established enemies when one is dead or dying make disingenuous statements of remorse to express that nobody wishes death upon their opponent. You'll find no such dissembling from me. As a writer, this, Fred Phelps is now in the process of doing probably the one thing that he'll ever do for which he will have my gratitude. He is dying. And while some part of me thinks the sooner the better, another part of me hopes he lingers long enough to savor the full terror that must consume a mind as superstitious and bitterly haunted as his during the last moments of life. In his life, the boss can be credited with many an inadvertent positive influence. As a caricature of cruel religious based in humanity, Phelps often rallied people in opposition to his stupidity, and he served as a ludicrous archvillain. He was a living argument ad absurdum in support of all things he detested and decried. On the eve of Phelps's death, I think there is much that the American public can be proud of. We can be proud of not only of the strong counter protests that followed Westboro Baptist Church, where they flagrantly and tastelessly displayed their disgusting malice, but also that we live in an environment where Fred Phelps was allowed to publicly spew his vindictive ideas with such infuriating and thoughtless impunity. It is infinitely better to suffer the few Fred Phelpses we surely, that will surely always exist than to live in a political environment in which odious speech is regulated by an officiating body. So I think that kind of embodies my thinking and values on free speech. And if anybody can read that and say that I'm defending Fred Phelps's ideas, I'm comfortable just saying that they're stupid. <laughs> <laughs> I feel that way about the KKK also. There was recently a KKK rally where they were violently assaulted. And I think when you censor or even violently assault somebody like the KKK, you give them too much credibility. You, you really empower them, make them feel victimized. Uh, you, you give them a martyrdom complex. If you mock them, if you ridicule them, if you diminish them and show them, close them for the idiots that they are, that is, that is 
infinitely superior, and then you, you, you really hope to achieve something. Instead of assaulting the KKK, I would say leave them alone. But if I were in that density, I think the idea would have been to hire clowns with banjos, pile them all into a little car, and trail along playing a, a mocking little soundtrack around them the whole time. I mean, make a, make a laughable spectacle out of it, and make them go home feeling like idiots. That's my take. <laughs> now, another situation where I feel like we get into dangerous territory where we arbitrarily throw out terms like, uh, like uh, hate speech or marginalizing to minorities is um, when we were going to do a black mass event at Harvard, we were asked by a student group who was exploring different uh, religious traditions if we could do some kind of presentation for their student group and if there was some kind of ritual we could attach to it. And I explained that we weren't really given to ritual or, or rote kind of procedure because we're about individual will and that type of thing. But the idea of the black mass was something that was well worth exploring as a springboard into the philosophy of Satanism, as well as the history. The idea being that uh, the idea of black mass came from Catholic propaganda against the other and was used to marginalize and justify killing people, but then was later embraced in some form by people who used it as a declaration of personal independence. And I was trying to explain to the press at the time that our practice of a black mass at this point was as far removed from uh, Catholicism as, as Easter is removed from its pagan roots, but, but it didn't take. And uh, you, you see there's some over 1,500 Catholics marching through Cambridge uh, to protest our, our little black mass reenactment event, <laughs> some of them sobbing. And I couldn't help but note that these were the exact same people who just some few years before couldn't be moved to take to the streets when they found out that their institution, especially there, was a, a pedophile rate. Yeah. Now, in Phoenix, we put out a press release in January. Actually, our people in Phoenix applied to give an invocation at the city council. Um, in December, and the, the city clerk just signed off and said that's fine. And um, it was a press release, and I explained in the press release that uh, church state separation advocates Andrew Seidel and Diane Post from the Freedom from Religion Foundation have been urging Phoenix for a number of years now to discontinue their policy of allowing their city council meeting to open with a public prayer. Seeing those requests ignored, FFR has fought hard to ensure that plurality is respected that any religion enjoys a voice in City Hall, and that atheist invocation will be heard too. With this open forum now in place, marginalized voices from alternative, alternative religious views may now enjoy a degree of exposure that is unprecedented. And I, 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 wanted, uh, I wanted to point out the, the difficult situation that Phoenix was in with us giving the invocation. That would be the demand for attendance. And I said, there's certainly no novelty at all to Christian invocations, and nobody's ever lost to find Christian houses of worship if they so choose. Satanism, on the other hand, is still largely a mystery to the general public. <laughs> when public forums allow for religious displays or performances, they do so to our advantage. We're grateful for Phoenix's public platform for Satanists, and I believe the people of Phoenix can expect us to be regular contributors to their religious movement. <laughs> Thanks in part to their city council. <laughs> Something that was disturbing, though, about uh, about the discussion that followed was people felt that the irrelevant question in all of this was, what do we believe, and, and, and what could they expect from us, and, and what intentions do we have? And while we do have our own tenets and our own beliefs, which tend to have nothing to do with what they think they do, um, I'm, I also was explaining in some of the interviews that that was not the question at all. We could be everything they thought we were. We could be this hateful, cruel group, and they opened the door to us. It is just simply not the place of the government to act as arbiter of what is proper religious or political speech. And I hope it stays that way. Now, here's some, here is some of the disturbing outcry that came at the next city council meeting. There is a constitution greater than 
American Constitution. It is substantiated or sustained by God Himself. I'm going to read the First Amendment. Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Satanism is not a religion, it's a cult. Because I think their goal is to silence prayer as opposed to your invocation. So your goal is to silence any kind of prayer whatsoever. We take the Pledge of Allegiance, it's one nation under God. That's not out there by mistake. <laughs> How many people actually have a dollar bill or a piece of money in their wallet or their pocket? I do believe it says, in God we trust. <laughs> and I've got people that are ready to demonstrate that you don't stand up for God. And right now, our domestic enemies seem to be pretty great. They are a hate group, and specifically, they are a misogynist group. You will see images of Michelle Short in bondage, in nudity, um, in all kinds of uh, positions that are not appropriate, a hate group who promotes violence against women. Their main goal is to silence any expression, any religious expression in public life. It's not a real religion. It just isn't. But in the world, you want to drive this home is to silence the other side. It's it, it considered to be by a woman like me to be terrorism. We can't allow the members of the city council of America to pick and choose who they want to give the education and only invite those people. It has to be open. And this country was founded on the principles of Judeo-Christian principles. We are not going to practice our religion behind our closed doors and behind the churches. We're going to practice it right here at city council. Don't sell your soul. On this. Our nation was founded on Judeo-Christian values and prayers. If we abandon him, he will abandon us. You will answer to God. It represents Jesus Christ. And when I hear all these people talking, they say, under God, well, which God are you talking about? I heard that gentleman just say, Jesus Christ, so if you're a Jew, is it not your God? Or is it a Muslim? Or are we just going with the religions of Abraham? Either you have everybody or you have nobody. It sends me. You know what's going on? I'm a Christian. I believe in the one true God. I want Christians to pray. I want those that believe in God, the one true God, to pray. And it will bring real message to everyone. We're one nation under God, believe it or not, like it. I will let the same worship of this great verses. I recommend the nation of the invocation from the agenda. The final part of it is to be God we trust. You seem to think that this prayer thing is all about you. But you work for us. You represent us. You are individuals who can say this prayer is doing that first day. But I myself served in a country called Iraq. It's not my business how you vote if you don't want to tell me and how you pray because I don't need a middle man between me and my God. I don't need a high priest. Christianity is becoming irrelevant and being politically correct is becoming relevant. We're going to lift up the name of Jesus. There is no other name that you're not going to by a man that you say in the name of Jesus Christ. Let's get that straight. We want to think about it. Jesus is the way. I'm a proud atheist, and I am here to ask you, as government officials, to honor the minority, to honor the minority in this community. This is a spiritual thing. This is a spiritual realm. This is evil against good, and the devil is out to, Satan is out to win, and we don't want to give him Phoenix. Many years ago, our government years ago, our government had a good idea to, in the First Amendment to keep separate religion and government. Also in Article 6, Paragraph 3, they said that the elected representatives are bound by an oath to the Constitution, not to the Bible. Now, because I don't bow to make God, does that make me subject to his views? That says that I'm too stupid to be represented by this council. I'm done. Matthew 6, 6 specifically states that when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. 
that your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. What we need to be doing is trying to put inclusion into government. I have personal knowledge of what Satanists do. I know that there are plenty of agencies in the United States to say that by inviting Satan is for a prayer. I was going to say this prayer to the I don't believe that the city has a choice but to allow it to happen. It is the goal of Satan to silence and muzzle people's voices. Our goal is not to shut down the Satanists, but it's our goal to shut down our agenda. Which is to bring death and destruction of this. I am proposed that only that everyone here is entitled to believe whatever they choose to believe. But I'm entitled to the use to impose each of their beliefs on all the rest of us. I challenge anyone here to open up and find the word democracy or republic in it. It isn't there. We do not live in a day of Christian culture. So when we invoke and spill the blessings of God on our faith and our sleep, are we invoking the curses of the deity spoken of that they serve as Satan? When I took my oath of citizenship, it was under God. I am a child of God. <laughs> Very good. I am a child of God. I will not let the top of the day my children for jumping this people or jumping with the government unless the government has no business in establishing a religion, but they have no business in regulating it either. You want to know that there are things worse than losses. Can imagine having Remember the same things that anyone who includes a real community invitation for the Satanic Temple should put their name in the record. I, Oslin Nicole Nicole, proudly stand with Thomas Jefferson and sign my name to protecting and defending the Constitution of the United States of America. Two fucking minutes. That's all we needed to speak. And they were saying that we were trying to silence everybody, that we were. Uh, that they were putting all these values onto us that had nothing to do with who we are. Uh, they were also saying, as you heard, that we're a hate group and specifically a misogynistic hate group. And you may wonder where that came from. That comes from the fact that the, the woman I showed in the picture earlier is a model and they're, they're, you can find pictures of her where she's in, in less than clothing. And this, of course, uh, induces people to, to beat and hate women. Um, but as I said, the idea of, of who we are and what we represent was the wrong question. And, and I think it should remain the wrong question. And we should insist upon the government viewpoint neutrality where they don't converge and decide whether they agree with the values in, in a specific community and whether they can speak on, on, on in, this, in the open forum or not. I think that's what we, we risk when we ask for more prohibitions against free speech. It's misguided. Uh, an obvious case where, uh, where the progressive agenda went wrong and was co-opted by the, the religious right, obviously, is the Re Religious Freedom Restoration Act. Um, this was actually passed federally under the Clinton administration in the 90s to uh, protect uh, minority religious groups, uh, in particular, there's a peyote sacrament done by the Native Americans in some certain church, wherever, and it was, uh, and they were being told that they could not do their peyote sacrament because this was a, a classified drug now, and this was this was against uh, current drug laws. So, uh, RIPRA, Religious Freedom Restoration Act, was passed and, and upheld that there was a there was a certain burden of proof upon the government to show uh, that they could impede on somebody's religious practice as, as such. And, and now, you know, RIFRA is, is generally known for the, the state manifestations of that past state by state since uh, the gay rights revolution, where now there's this idea that there's there are fakers all over the place who are having their spirits corrupted because they have to make these gay fakes, and, and they, they, won't be, they won't be allowed into heaven anymore. Um, people were contacting us 
as, as RIFRA became a, a topic of content asking if there was a way that satanic businesses could deny the service of Christians. And of course, uh, I, I would like to think that a satanic business would, would be uh, to inclusion that would bring them profit. Um, why, why, do, why do business so poorly? Um, one thing we thought we, we, we might like to do is we, we were pushing in Michigan where they were trying to pass RIFRA for an amendment to the bill that would ask that their discrimination be fully disclosed. So uh, far from putting prohibitions on speech, we wanted to make certain uh, hate speech mandatory to the, to the effect that if you're going to deny service to homosexuals or anybody else, you need to be upfront about that somewhere on the, the facade of the building, at the doorway or whatever else, so the onus isn't on the people coming into your place of business to find out that they're not served and go through that inconvenience and, and potential humiliation. Our uh, most creative use of RIFRA was our reproductive campaign. And um, it actually drawn up a, 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 an exemption form before Hobby Lobby. Um, and the exemption was against informed consent laws. And what the informed consent laws are, uh, they're, a, they're one of these bills that are passed to make abortions more prohibitive, more difficult uh, to get. And uh, informed consent in particular uh, insists that women be given certain materials that are scientifically invalid and, and really meant to make them reconsider having an abortion at all, reconsider their, their, their point of view. Um, going through narrated ultrasounds some of the time, being told that life begins at conception, and, um, and being counseled on all kinds of different alternative options and that type of thing. Uh, as problematic as that might sound and insulting as that might sound up front, um, in places like Missouri, uh, you find attached to the informed consent now a 72-hour waiting period in which a woman will come into the clinic, she'll have to receive these materials, and then can't have the procedure done until 72 hours later, three days. And um, my understanding is there's only one clinic in Missouri that performs abortions at this point. So somebody might have to travel five, six hours, come get these materials, go all the way back, or spend money for overnight lodging and that type of thing. And, and some people simply cannot do that. And our feeling with the informed consent materials is that it doesn't apply to us due to our religion and we're protected under RIFRA. Um, because we believe that the body is inviolable subject to one's own will alone and that includes fetal tissue um, and that we make our decisions based on the best scientific evidence and we feel that the best scientific evidence does not support the conclusion that life begins at conception. So uh, a year ago now about we actually got a plaintiff on this. She wanted to terminate her pregnancy in Missouri. Um, went in with an exemption form we had drawn up saying that as a member of the Satanic Temple, the informed consent materials did not apply to her, and therefore they could just go ahead and pass that. They did not agree to the state law, so we filed the lawsuit uh, immediately thereafter, a state lawsuit. And um, that leverage trip for Later on, we filed a, a federal complaint, uh, which is really a straightforward First Amendment complaint. Um, there's the Missouri, Missouri Informed Consent uh, booklet. Um, you can look it up online, so the full thing is there. You, you can see how problematic it is. But um, fortunately, they, they highlight some of the most problematic elements for you. And in the introduction, in the introduction you see a, a certain point of contention right up at the very top in bold. The life of each human being begins at conception. Abortion will terminate the life of a separate, unique, living human being. We would contend that that is, is obviously and flagrantly an item of religious opinion. And as such, uh, the, the government has no place in, in making its, its uh, dissemination mandatory. And to do so to somebody who shares our beliefs, or doesn't share those beliefs in any case, it is, a, is a violation of their First Amendment rights. And in our case, uh, definitely, definitely a RIFRA claim. Those those claims are still pending in court right now. They're they're really dragging their feet. I feel it my duty to point out that we did not secure pro bono support. ACLU never replied. So if you have the inclination, I think uh, this is the best thing going for reproductive rights right now. 
and it's the only thing to really turn the tide of religious abuse against uh, uh, people who believe differently than the conservative right, uh, we do have a <coughs> we do have a donation button for our, our legal foot case online, so be sure to check that out. And if you buy our uh, merchandise that goes towards all our campaigns as well. Um, another case where we were putting forward our our free speech to much resistance was the case of the Black Mountain Men. And I'm sure you're probably aware of that. That, that was, that, that, that uh, garnered quite a bit of press. Um, in Oklahoma in 2009, there was a bill passed that allowed for the Ten Commandments Monument to reside on the state property outside the, outside the state house on Capitol grounds. Um, it, it's interesting, if you read these bills that are meant to justify the Ten Commandments, the bills are also written to rewrite history. And it's funny that once the, these bills are written and passed, they're then cited as academic text, um, as a basis for history. So when these claims are made that the Ten Commandments has some kind of unique privileged place in American history as helping the codification of constitutional law, um, that, that is very much worth uh, contesting, both on academic and, and uh, simple legalistic grounds because uh, what's coming next is, is an abridgment of any alternative reasons rights uh, to display a similar monument. Just as you can see in uh, the disturbing display in Phoenix where people are holding up money and saying, because it says in God we trust that they're given some kind of a license that they that they have, uh, they're more privileged than any other religion, more equal, uh, so to speak, in Orwell's terms. Um, it, it gives you a sense of how any time that, uh, that line between church and state is crossed over, you need to beat it back and beat it back very hard and immediately because that's only a first step. I know some people think, you know, that it, it doesn't mean that much that we say um, under God in the Pledge of Allegiance or that the money says in God we trust. But you can see that that's just, that's just one element and it just keeps growing from there. And now those bits of evidence are used for the idea that this is a Christian nation and that, that Christians have exclusive privilege and exclusive rights. And that's something uh, I felt uh, was very uh, aptly displayed in our monument battle. I, I felt the, the symbolism is, is so bombastic and, and catching and, and everything our victory would mean in the Baphomet uh, battle uh, would, uh, would show so much, you know, just to have our monument there next to the Ten Commandments, it would make people think different, I think, it would think correctly about the place of, of plurality and about religious liberty in the United States. Obviously, it's, it's a lesson many people need, and, and many people, uh, even, even in our public offices, which is very disturbing. Um, in Oklahoma, uh, we were surprised. We wanted to file our lawsuit against Oklahoma for not replying to our request around the time we were going to have our unveiling of the complete monument in Detroit. But uh, to our surprise, the state Supreme Court uh, ruled that the Ten Commandments Monument needed to come down. There was a deal you sued against it, uh, Establishment Clause case, but uh, based on the state constitution. The state constitution is very explicit in its separation of church and state, saying no federal funds or federal property can be used for religious purposes. And the, there was a prevalent feeling in the media, and we, they reached out to us quite a bit, which was surprising. Usually, if, if we're not if we're not mentioned exclusively, people don't don't realize our role in anything at all. Uh, around the Black Mass event, the Pope himself said that um, pedophilia somehow wasn't the problem of Catholic Church because uh, that was not a Catholic activity. It would be similar to doing a Black Mass. And sometime around uh, uh, the height of our Monument Press, also Putin said made some kind of comment about how. Uh, Americans are trying to put uh, Satanism on a level equal to traditional religion. And uh, I really thought the, the press would be off the hook for that, but nobody seemed to put it together. It was us. But they did credit us for the uh, coming down saying that the Supreme Court of Oklahoma must have had in mind that if they ruled in some way to keep up the Ten Commandments, they're going to have a very difficult time and they were going to have to be reckoning with, with our case. Uh, soon enough. Um, 
But our unveiling event met with all kinds of controversy and protest as well. It's similar to what you could see in Phoenix. Uh, all of a sudden, the mainstream religious groups felt that they were persecuted and that we were a hate group and that somehow by our activities, even having a, a private event, ticketed event, but nobody had to attend it, um, <laughs> that somehow we were trying to, uh, that we were trying to silence them, that we were trying to silence the, the Christian voice. And then of course, you see this idea of Christian privilege, uh, anytime it's dampened, they, they, they feel persecuted in, in the main rights movement and everything else. Now, here was an image from when the Ten Commandments was coming down. Um, I was going to show earlier, the after the Pink Mass, the uh, Westboro Baptist Church put together one of their uh, famous flyers against us. And, uh, and, and in one image on the flyer, which they posted on many things, there's an American flag. And in front of them were, were two uh, stick characters, the type you see on, on restroom doors to indicate the, the generic person. And one was bent over and the other was behind him for whatever reason. But it looks suspiciously similar to. Some of this, it's, it's all very prophetic. Um, and when Dan Robertson was complaining about us, uh, he was he was crying the apocalypse, and he was saying, "What next? Is there going to be a ritual on some state house lawn?" And everybody laughed and said, "He's a delusional old man." <laughs> Months later, the Detroit chapter of the temple did a ritual on the state house lawn in in East Lansing because they had allowed some kind of Christian performance there as well and had opened the door. So Pat Robertson is still a delusional old part. Uh. Here was some of the, the outrage surrounding that phenomenon. <laughs> so now they're forgiving happy because you have the men taken down. But do you are you still pushing to have the goat with the horns and so on go out the cattle rounds? No, we, we don't want to remind you there about the Ten Commandments there. Um, the point uh, all along is that we complement and contrast the Ten Commandments and reaffirm that we live in a pluralistic nation that respects uh, diversity and religious liberty. First of all, we say that being homosexual is a constitutional right. Before that, we say that slavery and unborn babies was a constitutional right. And now, we want to unveil a statue of Satan. In the midst of that economically plagued city, can you believe that? Yes, I can. 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 Yes, but the thing with the you know, the horns and so on, the Ten Commandments goes off because not only does it have religious meaning, but it has a historical meaning too. I mean, would you acknowledge that about the Ten Commandments? Well, I would, if you would acknowledge that, as a historical meaning. The Ten Commandments is the Ten Commandments in the 19th century. This is all the case. In the end, we will beg the Lord. We will beg for destruction. So, could we possibly be serving others and be sacrificing our babies uh, to some heathen uh, God? Uh, is there something that we want to be having ritual sacrifice on the state that is wrong in some state? Are we making a mockery of everything with regard to Christianity in this society? Now we're going to have a satanic monument next to the Ten Commandments, right? I mean, the U.S. Supreme Court has already ruled that the, the Ten Commandments, that the displays not only have a religious significance, but also a historical one. Well, you, you're talking about a different type of issue because in Oklahoma, they were ruling by the state constitution, not the federal constitution. I know, but it's a different issue. It's not that different. You're right, Texas. It's not a different constitution. I don't know.
revise their state constitution so that um, they take out the, uh, the items that separate church and state. Uh, doesn't really get stupider than that, but in, uh, in Arkansas, they passed a bill that plagiarized directly off the Oklahoma bill, and, uh, and now they're looking to put up a tech man in Syracuse. Uh, we're currently fighting a battle in Arkansas, and who knows we might have to come back to Oklahoma, but I, I didn't expect to get cut off by Megan Kelly so early on. And what I was really trying to get her to do was say that a uh, federal ruling uh, trumped any state ruling, and that the, the, the federal the federal finding in, in this Texas case needed to be abided by by Oklahoma, just because I thought it would be really nice to see uh, a Fox News commentator yielding to. Uh, the idea of, of federalism to the degree, <laughs> but, it, but it didn't happen. Otherwise, I would have argued that there was nothing in the in the Texas ruling that would have backed that off of property, which is true. Uh, so, in another way, where we might try to interpret our speech is by citing community standards, some kind of vagary uh, related to what's offensive or whatever else, even though we're, we're very well protected um, as a, a religion, we, we also see, uh, like in the case in, in Florida, uh, there's Orange County Public Schools in Florida, and now uh, a public school group in, in Colorado where we're doing a similar thing that's in process right now. They're allowing the passive distribution of Christian literature, Bibles and, and pamphlets about Jesus and all that shit. But, uh, <laughs> passive distribution means they can set up a table, and, and if and if kids are so moved to do so, they can they can get a copy and that kind of thing, which is fine, I guess, so long as they, they realize they open up an open forum, and that's what we were testing in Orange County when we applied to also give out our material, and, and all, all hell broke loose then, of course. It was originally the Freedom From Religion Foundation that reached out to us and apprised us of the issue, and um, they were asking if perhaps we had materials we could give out uh, to, to students during this past distribution open forum because they wanted to test what one of the attorneys at the Freedom from Religion Foundation now calls Solutions Law, which is <laughs> when, you offer these, when you offer the satanic material to an open forum, they're either going to deny us and open themselves up to litigation or, uh, or they're going to shut the forum down. <laughs> Solutions law doesn't account for them actually allowing for us to distribute the material, but I didn't have to do it. When the Freedom from Religion Foundation reached out to us, they were clear, they said we could be very critical of religion. Um, and, and they were, you know, the, the kind of material they wanted to put out was, was this. It, it's, it's material that's critical of, uh, uh -huh. critical of the Jesus story, critical of the Bible. And the school tried denying them on obscenity grounds previously, and then they, they threatened to sue, and then they were allowed. Um, because it turns out that all the material they were discussing was in the Bible, which was being distributed. But um, <laughs> when they told us that we could be kind of confrontational and offensive like that, uh, we let them know that that's really how we play things. We have our own affirmative values. 
we're not actually out just attacking the other side. We're, we're putting out our, our own material in our own right. And so, for that matter, the, uh, the school board was saying that they still reserve the right. As soon as this got out to the press that we had offered to, to submit material to them for passive distribution, the school board was trying to calm everybody down because there was already a, a big Catholic petition saying, keep, uh, keep Satanists out of schools and all this. And there was already uh, misreporting going on saying that we were already there and we were converting beyond and that type of thing. And when, uh, one blog site even said that we must save the children from the horrors of, of the satanic activity book that we were putting out, which turned out was ridiculously benign and intentionally so. We really didn't want to give them anything at all where they could point to community standards or, or, or any kind of pre-existing standards because they couldn't manufacture new ones and say that this is in some way offensive. This was absolutely beyond reproach. There was nothing uh, negative they could find about it. Very pro-social and just some activities in there, word searches, uh, maze, connect the dots, that type of thing. And no real philosophy in it because we're not really for colonization we were making a point about the separation of church and state. And it worked, they, they shut down the open forum rather than, than subject children to the horrors of this activity. Here was something that's um, <laughs> word search and, and dots that it might not be clear to you now, but actually in this, in this video, uh, you see it. Uh, Panic shows the coloring book is creating controversy in Orlando, but if you read between the lines, the issue is a lot deeper than black and white. The Orange County School Board is considering changing its beliefs regarding religious materials after a group of local Satanists asked to hand out a Satanic themed coloring book. The request is in response to the board allowing other religions, or religious, religious groups, that is, to lead Bibles and booklets for students. Public education in America often uses coloring books to teach young Americans about math, science, and current events. This year, a new book filled with games and lessons about Satanism could be distributed to students attending public school in Florida's Orange County. The 10-page Satanic Children's Big Book of Activities features characters named Annabelle and Damien who demonstrate rituals to explain Satanism. This extending wealth of information for America's young minds was made possible after a Florida judge last month ruled that if the Orange County School District allowed Christian groups to disseminate Bibles and other materials in its schools, then other religious and atheist groups should be given the same right to distribute their material. And followers of the Antichrist see <laughs> the <laughs> A spokesman for the Satanic Temple tells you all story that, quote, if a public school board is going to allow religious pamphlets and full Bibles to be distributed to students, as is the case in Orange County, Florida, we think the responsible thing to do is to ensure that these students are given access to a variety of different religious themes, as opposed to standing idly by while one religious voice dominates the discourse and delivers propaganda to youth. Unquote. The Bible distributions are a big thing. Uh, they haven't caused any problems. They've flown on without incident. Uh, now, by creating controversy, uh, this group is, is made perhaps getting what it wants. My office alone, I received close to 11,000 UIC 148 hour period on this issue. And it gives you an idea of the level of disruption that it was causing. The spokesperson for the Satanic Temple said it's laughable that religious groups think that the inability to distribute their materials exclusively is discriminatory against them. I think if you're going to put our material, that's supposed to be a sacred material. Maintaining religious neutrality, students who may never have intended to learn about Christianity, atheism, or Satanism will now receive an introduction to all three. Okay, that's all I got. I hope I made some kind of point. <laughs> Let me know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they said so. <laughs>
<laughs> um, the concept of decency is that why uh, Batman was chosen to have uh, not the female breasts that it normally is. There is probably the most contentious dialogue about a pair of breasts I've ever well, second. Second most contentious dialogue about pair of breasts I ever had was was about keeping keeping the breasts on Batman. I was advocating for it as part of was doing the sculpting, and and we knew that if we kept the bare the bare chest out, the bare female chest, they they would change the issue. They would say that this is this is a decency standard. You know, this is this this is community standards. This is this is pornography. We can't have this. And that wasn't the battle we wanted to fight. But I still like the, the hermaphroditic notion of Baphomet, and that's part of the whole thing, those, those binaries, the reconciliation of opposites and that kind of thing. So I kept telling him, you need to put you need to put something over it then. We need something draping it or whatever. But then when he was showing me the models I had to agree, it looked awful. So it ultimately and everybody else was for it. I would I must say I was the strongest holdout on that, um, just for historical purposes or whatever else, but ultimately I did agree that it's a symbol and it's malleable to change and that we were free to give it give it a, a male chest and some some people have taken offense at that and they, they don't like it or whatever else but ultimately it comes down to we want to get shit done and we, want, we wanted to fight the battle on our terms and we weren't going to give them and give them anything to work with and that's that's how bad it turned out the way it is now were there any further questions uh, have you received any direct contact from the Westboro Baptist Church from all of your counter protests? Well, it's, no, but but they do give us the satisfaction of getting very pissed off and, and <laughs> putting together their flyers and that kind of thing. I mean, a lot of this does give give a lot of satisfaction. Before I was doing this, I could uh, get very angry and, and read an article and, and you know rant about it privately. But it's nice to be able to direct tweet the Westboro Baptist Church, and then and you can just tell whoever's replying as their, their veins are popping out and they're, <laughs> they're, they're very upset by this, especially when they went through and, and, and made one of their flyers with the miles of text upon it, uh, rallying against us. And also it's very satisfying to see this uh, th this very thick skull member of the school board giving us the satisfaction of saying, after three years of the Freedom From Religion Foundation fighting them and telling them that this Bible distribution was a problem, even though they were saying it's never been a problem before and we tried to manufacture controversy, to, to stand there looking uh, uh, beleaguered, saying that in, in the course of one 24-hour period, you received 11,000 emails. <laughs> and there was also a time I made some kind of disparaging comments about Ted Cruz uh, to National Journal, and I was happy that his uh, his personal public relations person reached out to to take offense by that. <laughs> and it uh, makes it all worth it. <laughs> I can just ruin one person's <laughs> I have a question about the term religious non-believer. Um, how do you, like, obviously that's a little bit counterintuitive in like a Western context. Um, can you explain exactly what you define like religion as? I, I would look towards legal definitions because I think they're the only ones that are, are tenable. Um, I think items of religious opinion are, are, are worthy of uh, being protected, and, and that's really, if you read the writings of Jefferson, that seemed to be the, the lines he was thinking along, he even explicitly stated it as such. To say that because somebody doesn't hold the supernatural beliefs, their, their values don't mean as much is insane. We have to look towards other things. When we have a sense of cultural identity, we have a community, have a shared set of deeply held beliefs, and that's enough. But I don't think we should try narrowly defining it more. I think it's a big mistake uh, when, when other atheists argue against religion because religion does give you privileges it does give you exemptions and you're just handing that over to the other side if you're going to say that you insist on defining religion religion on their terms just, just giving them that advantage that's something david silverman and i agree with uh although we're on very different terms is that then where your philosophy for some like a, a new atheist way Type of thing, or you still consider yourself a religious person, or anyone truly a religious person? Well, I, I do think you need to have some set of 
community and share deeply established, deeply held beliefs and values. Otherwise, you get into that kind of where people are making claims as mere items of convenience. And, and clearly, we're not doing that, I don't think, when it comes to the uh, abortion case or whatever else. We're citing tenants that were pre existing before we had put our exemption into place, and, uh, and we're able to cite those tenants in a way that oddly, uh, the, the religious right cannot. I mean, look at look at the Hobby Lobby case. Where are you going to find scriptural justification for the fact that a corporation needs to be treated as a, as an individual personality and uh, and as a religious one should not have to pay healthcare benefits that might go to, towards certain types of contraceptives. And even deeper than that, it's very difficult to find prohibitions against abortion in the Bible. Everybody thinks it must be there the way they rant and rave about it, but it's just not the case. It, this, this is very vague. So if you're going to compare uh, scriptural connection, actual belief that's religious based to the claims being made, well, I think we have a much stronger case. Of course, they'll try to, uh, they, they might try to attack the, our, our history and say we're not, you know, we're too new or whatever, but th th those aren't actual legal arguments we need to be about. That, that's just too, it's just such vague territory that we're not really worried about that in, in the court system at all. Uh, what well, kind of reactions have you gotten from other religious groups like Jews, Muslims, Buddhists? Like not that bad, actually. Um, I mean, it varies, of course, but it seems like a lot of the other minority groups also feel maligned and marginalized and a lot of them seem to like what we're doing and we do get messages of support from people who identify as christian but they say they understand what we're we're up to and that they approve of it on that those kinds of uh, government neutrality grounds constitutional law liberty and that type of thing i mean you'll find you'll find fools in, in every camp though if, if I had uh, shown the whole clip on Fox where you saw the panel that had atheist David Silverman, uh, Catholic League president uh, uh, Bill Donahue, and, and there was a rabbi, Rabbi Shmuley. Um, the rabbi made the remarkable statement uh, regarding our Baphomet monument that if we could find one Satanist amongst the founding fathers, we might have a case. And I don't know why nobody stopped the panel right then and said, can you find one Jew? <laughs> yes. Um, first of all, I, I love the strategy you guys have employed. I think it's great. Um, my frustration, what I'm looking at, and based on your experience, when you have your legislators that are going out there basically waging war against the Constitution and against you know civil rights, um, what is the next best step that you can see that we have not necessarily uh, we don't have an angle into just yet. How do we staunch that um, compromise? We, the situation is dire, and we are the last line of defense. <laughs> we are the, and we are the only credible offense right now. I don't think people realize how ugly it is, and how and how in how desperate we are to to make some of these fights work. I really think. Uh, I really don't have any tolerance anymore for people who turn their back on us because they all get the same symbolism or whatever, especially reproductive rights issues. We have so many uh, uh, reproductive rights institutions that are fine with the status quo. You know, they're, they're raising up their funds and they're trying to build new clinics or whatever else, but it's not doing a whole lot against the, uh, against the weasel bills people are passing to try to make abortion impossible. And I think the only thing we have going right now is, is our case in which we're using their own arguments. You know, we're using religious privilege exemption to fight this. And I think that's where we're left right now. And I think if, if there's to be other fronts open on this, they'll have to be, uh, they'll, they'll have to be similar simply in a different name. And, and that's fine too, but we're saving this, so. <laughs> A question about um, what could potentially be the next logical step in the efforts in Missouri to the 72 hour ban if they come to fruition, if we get our way, uh, could that potentially lead to the benefit of less uh, religious involvement in the decisions of what procedures are available? For instance, uh, my wife uh, was required to go to a different hospital to have a DNC performed. 
uh, when we lost the pregnancy because where we were at, that was considered an abortion. Really? Mercy Hospital. Same so uh, your question is, if we win, where, where are we at? And would, that, would, that have, uh, would that potentially enable uh, further legal standing well, right. I, I think it would, I think it would cause the politicians to think a little harder about the the uh, about the exemptions they try to put it the, the religious bills they try to put forward, and I, I think our activity in general is making people think twice about these things. Um, it's happened a few times at least now where people have suggested uh, religious displays for Christmas or or a Ten Commandments monument, and somebody has had the foresight to say, "Well, what if the Satanists come?" <laughs> and that kind of thing. And I think there actually may be a place for religious privilege and exemption. It's just there's no place for only one party to be claiming it. So if, if we're putting it forward just as vehemently, um, hopefully we'll find a plateau at which it's sensible. Of course, I feel like the peyote sacrament should be able to be performed and that type of thing. <clears throat> but right now, you know, we're fighting against people who felt that they've had a monopoly on religion for so long. And have alienated so many people by asserting that, and, and so um, they're making Satanists. You know, <laughs> I feel like they're really bringing the people to us. And if we win in Missouri, I feel a lot of people uh, will be forced to reconsider their beliefs, and there will be a lot of people willing to align with us and sign over and sign the exemption form. It's it's the devil's bargain, you know. <laughs> Yes, sir. Why do you think this, this sort of uh, this regression in terms of political thinking or scientific thinking is happening? As in the Ten Commandments, Ten Commandments monuments must have been there for the last what, 200 years, or I don't know. Why do you think that now suddenly it's becoming an issue and the whole war against Christmas and the persecution conflicts? Why is this an issue now when the whole world is heading forward and these things seem to be going backwards in the US? I don't know. I think you've got institutions like Liberty University, and after a certain point, they couldn't invest much in the sciences anymore because it, it completely contradicted everything they believe. They're not going to have a, a really rigorous evolutionary biology program, so they're priming everybody to get into politics, and it's to the point where it seems like every highly motivated evangelical is trying to run for office now. And I, I really don't feel that they represent the majority. I was looking at uh, pupil results from a couple years ago, but I mean, given the trend, uh, it's, it's even further in our favor now. But over 50%, some 53% of Americans in general um, agree that abortion should be legal. And, and it's some 41%, uh, I believe, that feel like it should not. And, uh, and, and that, that trend is, seems to be continuing um, more towards the balance of, of allowing abortion to remain legal. And yet it seems we have a preponderance of politicians who are trying to make this the primary issue and something to fight for. And it really does cause people to galvanize around a, a politician. I, I think a, a sad, I think there's a sad uh, trend amongst non-believers to minimize these issues and take them. As, as being just part of part of the homeostasis of the political sphere, and really we need to push back hard and often all the time, and, and never forget about it. I would just like to make sure that uh, you folks realize we do have our own Ten Commandments uh, statue here. In Monuments in Jeff City, so. Oh, it's all in Arkansas. Picture, what do you say? <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah, we, we like that from that too. We like that from that too here in Missouri. Are there uh, any big events or another any, uh, target coming up in, you know, up, up on the horizon or in the coming months that you're specifically wanting to make a point of? Uh, well, like I said, we do have a protest coming up in San Francisco against the professional organization that the therapist who dealt with uh, the woman who killed her eight year old. It, I mean, that's a very kind of complex issue. You, you have to look at it. That's the problem with that one. I'm really trying to draw attention to problems in the mental health field. And media today isn't that much interested in things that can't be summarized in the headline. And this one's 
this one's a very difficult kind of issue, but it's something I'm really interested in fighting, and, and we're going to have a lot more material. We set, we're setting up a separate website about that issue right now. Um, but in the near future here, we have some kinks and details to work out, but we're going to open up a physical headquarters as well. So you'll want to be on the lookout for that. Did you have a question? Um, uh, yeah. oh. No, I didn't have one. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, as I guess most of you are probably aware, there's a uh, very strong likelihood uh, that this odious uh, anti or right to discriminate against queers uh, and then the very uh, past for the Missouri State Constitution, or added to the Missouri State Constitution. I think that it's pretty safe to say that that's going to occur. And I'm just curious if, uh, in terms of strategy, um, if, how. A, if you all have sort of given any thought, and, and, and B, if if so, what strategies could we could be used to fight that? Um, sort of akin to what you've done in the past. Well, I'd say the simple thing would be to just stop being queer. Why does it cause such a problem? We <laughs> <laughs> get that all the time. You know, people say, "Why Satan? Why why do you have to? Why Satanists? You know, as as though it would be." It would be helpful if, if we came at it in a, a different way. If we if we didn't follow our own conscience and, and refer to ourselves as Satanists because that's how we contextualize our, our beliefs, our works, our goals, and that type of thing. Um, that if we could, if we just uh, just start accommodating to the other side in that way, because this thing's been going so nice, we came along and fucked everything up. But um, as for as for the anti-gay amendment, I, I feel like. That's that's really working against the trend and on the wrong side of history. I, I have I'm very pessimistic about many things, but on things like that, I feel like even if they pass now, they, they don't stand a prayer, so to speak, uh, <laughs> going forward in the future. I mean, I don't have any uh, any definite plan for for tackling that now, but we could definitely go. <laughs> Well, what, what's the evidence that it does? I mean, it, it depends. It's it's completely uh, a matter of definition at that point, and we don't feel it. It's a religious argument, we feel. I mean, somebody can't say that it absolutely does. Somebody can't say it doesn't. I mean, there again, what what's life? Is it, the, is it that you have cells in motion? Is it, you know, a chromosomal mix? Or, or you know, I would say that, for somebody to be taken into legal consideration, they need, at least need to have some type of cognitive abilities. They need to have some kind of nervous system or whatever else. Uh, a cluster of cells, blastocysts, whatever else, I, I don't really feel are, are afforded those kinds of accommodations. But I'm completely fine with somebody believing otherwise. You know, they and theirs just simply don't need to get abortions. <laughs> Simple. Yeah. We're good. All right, just a quick reminder to everyone, we have a comment card box up in the front of the lobby area, and then also we're all going to be going to the Heidelberg, there's an open invitation to anyone at 6.30, so that's coming up pretty soon. Thank you. Thank you.